Hi, art historians. In this video, we're going to talk about the traditions that artists establish and how they change over time. Before you continue watching the video, please make sure that you've read the sections of Stockstad, chapter five, because that will help you really understand what we're talking about in this video. One of my favorite holiday traditions is watching a Charlie Brown Christmas. The classic cartoon created by artist Charles Schultz, where the Peanuts gang explores the true meaning of Christmas. Think for a moment about your favorite family tradition. It might be a special trip you take every year, or that one dish your mom has to cook for a special holiday. Every family has certain ways of doing things that make their holidays unique. And these special things, doing these special things year after year, makes them traditions. When a larger group of people are connected by a way of doing things, we call it culture. Our cultural traditions tie us together as people who share experiences and values and pass rituals and ideas down to their children and grandchildren. In this video, we will explore how artistic traditions are established and how they change over time. Just like your family might do things a little bit different than the way your grandparents did. We will look at how the Egyptian cultural tradition of human figuration influenced the Greek tradition and how the Greeks themselves innovated or developed their own tradition over time. But first, let's look at Charlie Brown as an example of cultural tradition and of terms we use to describe tradition and change in art history. Charlie Brown is an American icon, an easily recognizable character in our culture. What makes him an icon? Well, we recognize him visually through symbols like his big round head, wobbly smile, curly bangs, and of course, his yellow shirt with black zigzag stripe. We also recognize his personality as a lovable loser, a nervous, insecure kid who, despite his shortcomings, just doesn't give up. Finally, there's stories that Charles Schultz created about Charlie Brown, like Lucy always pulling the football away just as he tries to kick it. The narratives back up the idea of Charlie Brown as a caricature of a normal kid, as Schultz intended. We'll talk more about icons and narratives later in this course. For now, let's focus on how Charlie Brown is depicted. Did you know that Charlie Brown didn't originally look like the cartoon you see here? Like other famous cartoon characters, such as Mickey Mouse and Winnie the Pooh, Charlie Brown has changed over time. The artist Charles Schultz first drew him like this. His head a little more oblong, eyes farther apart, and without the black zigzag on his shirt. This earlier edition shows us how Schultz's style changed as he developed the Peanuts characters. We can easily recognize the iconography of Charlie Brown's character, but we can also see how the method changed just slightly. In art history, when a subject is represented according to a set style of rules or a certain method, we call it stylization. Once you recognize the iconography of a subject, you'll be able to identify it, even if this stylization is vastly different. There's this cool trend among designers of making stylized posters for popular movie characters like this minimal Charlie Brown. Now, even though we easily recognize these stylized cartoons as figures, I don't think anyone would think Charlie Brown would actually look like that if he walked through the door. When something is represented how it appears in the natural world, we call it naturalistic. Often people will say something looks realistic when really we mean naturalistic. Realism was the late 19th century art movement concerned with depicting mundane and even harsh situations, or real life, in an honest and straightforward manner. So to avoid confusion with the art movement, art historians use the term naturalism to describe accurate representation of a subject. If you take a look on Blackboard, there's a really cool video of a naturalistic Charlie Brown in a commercial. getting dirty and sometimes really dirty fortunately all oxy fights tough grass stains better than the leading value detergent a lot better so it's perfect for all the pig pens out there thanks mom blah, blah, blah. give us your worst we'll give it our all When a subject is rendered according to cultural ideals about perfection, we call it idealized. 
we could say that the center image is our ideal of what Charlie Brown should look like, but I wanted to find another example that might represent Charlie Brown as an idealized American guy. Now, this not, might not be your idea of the perfect guy, but I think he checks off a lot of mainstream ideas about what an attractive guy looks like. Throughout this course, we will have to keep reminding ourselves that most often, artists idealize their subjects according to what was considered perfect or beautiful at the time. We do exactly the same thing today by photoshopping out all of the so-called imperfections of already beautiful models and even distorting their proportions to create the glossy ads we see in magazines, movies, and even on TV. Finally, let's look at an example of innovation. Have you heard about the new Peanuts movie? It's supposed to come out in November 2015, and it represents the newest things in cartoons, 3D animation. I love how this version takes the classic tradition of Charlie Brown and represents him in a new way. So now that we understand the terms, stylized, naturalistic, and idealized, let's look at ancient traditions of representing the human figure. This is the palette of King Narmer, created in pre-dynastic Egypt around 3000 BCE. It's made out of a stone called gray whack, and its function is a ceremonial makeup palette. You know how the Egyptians wore that black eyeliner with the wing going way out from the corner of the eye? Girls, you know what I'm talking about. Well, a palette like this one would have been used to mix and store eyeliner. This one probably wasn't for everyday use, but just for show or maybe special ceremonies. A contemporary example would be a silver brush and mirror set or a de decorative wash basin that your grandma or your mom might have in the bathroom. King Narmer was one of the early pharaohs in Egypt, and this palette depicts the king triumphing over his enemies and uniting Upper and Lower Egypt. Even though the unification of Egypt occurred over several centuries, this monument gives King Narmer the sole credit for uniting Egypt and proclaims his power and authority as being blessed by the gods specifically the goddess Bat, represented in the upper hand, uh, represented by the horn bulls at the top, and the god Horus, the falcon holding the papyrus, the symbol of Lower Egypt. While the palette is filled with significant symbols of Upper and Lower Egypt, our real focus today is how the figure of King Narmer is represented. Take a moment and write down some observations in your notes about how the figures are represented here. Are they naturalistic? Idealized? stylized, or some combination of the three. Stop the video and write down five things you notice. The ancient Egyptians had a very strict style for representing human figures. They chose to use the clearest view of each part of the body. The head in profile as seen from the side, except for the eye, which is represented as if you were looking straight at the person the shoulders and to torso viewed from the front, and the hips, legs, and feet are also in profile. Try standing like this, and you'll see how unnatural this pose is. We call it composite pose because it is made up of various views of the body. The Egyptians were pretty strict about always using this style to represent the most important figures in their society. The style remained the same for thousands of years. This is a detail of the papyrus scroll called the Judgment of Hunifer before Osiris. During the New Kingdom period, scrolls like this one would be rolled up with the wrappings of mummified bodies to be used as a guidebook or a map to the afterlife, where one's heart would be weighed before the gods to determine if the person was worthy of entering the afterlife or deserving of being eaten by the crocodile, lion, hippo god, Amit. The scroll was painted around 1285 BCE more than 1,600 years after the Narmer palette. Stop the video again and sketch Hunifer, the figure in the white robe, and label how he is represented in the composite pose. The Egyptians used composite pose to represent figures on a flat, two-dimensional surface, like relief sculptures and scroll paintings. When representing people in three dimensions, or in the round, Egyptians maintain the same stylistic tradition while also modeling the figures more naturalistically. In King Menkari and Queen, we can see Menkari in the traditional rigid, balanced stance with one foot stepping forward and his arms straight at his side. 
We also see the more naturalistic rounded forms of the muscular body instead of the flattened, broken perspectives of the two-dimensional composite pose. While this sculpture in the round is more naturalistic, we can also see idealization of the figures. Even though this sculpture was created at the end of Menkari's life, actually, we think he died before it was completed because it remains unfinished. The king is depicted as an athletic, youthful figure. The traditional timeless pose, the never aging idealization of the figure, and the hard enduring gray wax stone all communicate the Egyptian belief that the ka, or spirit, could live eternally as long as the mummy or a statue like this one existed. You may know the Greek myth of Daedalus, the genius artist and architect who built wings for himself and his son to escape from the imprisonment on the island of Crete, only to have his son Icarus ignore his father's warnings, fly too close to the sun, which melted his wings, and fall to his demise in the sea. Well, the Greeks also told stories of how Daedalus traveled to Memphis, Egypt, where he built a temple and brought back the Egyptian compositional patterns for representing the figure. Whether or not this actually happened, we do know that the Greeks established a trading colony called Necrotus in Egypt, and we see the, the enormous influence the Egyptians had on the Greeks, not only in legends like Daedalus, but also in Greek art and architecture. This is the Anavisos Koros, created in the 6th century BCE, and found at the cemetery at Anavisos near Athens. It was a grave marker for a young man named Kroisos, who was killed in war. Kouros is the Greek word for young man, and the Greeks made many sculptures like this one, probably representing warriors, gods, or athletes. The Peplos quarry found near the Acropolis in Athens represents the early Greek stylistic tradition for representing chori, or young women. Since we've been focusing on representations of male figures, let's embear the Anavisos Koros to Minkari. How are the stylistic traditions similar? How are they different? Stop the video again and list three similarities and three differences of how the male figure is represented in the two sculptures. While the Anavisos Koros stands in the same rigid frontal pose as Menkare, Greek Koroi differed from the Egyptian type in two important ways. First, the Greek sculptors liberated the figure from the stone, creating completely freestanding sculptures, quite a feat considering the balance required to support heavy marble on relatively thin ankles. Instead of focusing on permanence, the Greeks were fascinated with creating lifelike figures and a sense of movement. Even the facial expression, called the archaic smile, makes the figures seem more alive. Second, and most notably, Greek chori are nude and generic, while Menkari's clothing and facial features make him individually recognizable. The bodies and faces of Greek chori are so idealized that we can't tell them apart from Greek images of deities with their perfect bodies on display for all to see. But the Greeks weren't done innovating the representation of the human form. Just 50 years after the Anavisos Koros, really a blink in the timeline of ancient art, Greek sculptors had moved far from the stiff frontality of the archaic Koroi to make more relaxed, lifelike figures, such as this one, called Critios Boy. In the history of art, Critios Boy is a watershed moment. The first time a sculptor depicted how humans actually stand with weight shifted on one foot and hips slightly tilted. Again, try standing like Menkare or the Anavisos Koros and you will feel how unnatural and rigid the pose really is. But shift your weight to one side and feel how natural it is to stand like Critios Boy. This shift and slight turn of the head, called contrapposto, was actually quite a radical break with the millennial old tradition of representing human figure. In a span of just a few decades, Greek sculptors rapidly innovated the lifelike depiction of figures. The contrapposto is more pronounced in the Raiche warrior, who originally held a spear and shield and wore a helmet. The turn of his head and twist of his shoulders make the figure appear like he is preparing for battle with a far-off foe. The warrior's back shows us another interesting development in Greek figures. Exaggeration. Not only are his muscles particularly ripped, but the line of his spine extends all the way down his back without interruption. 
If you feel the small of your back, you'll notice that your pelvic bone creates a flat spot, an interruption in that line. However, the ancient Greeks found that line so beautiful, so perfect, that they began exaggerating the figure beyond what is humanly possible to create an even more ideal representation. See, even the ancients used Photoshop. The Greeks weren't satisfied with just breaking the rules. They rewrote them. In the mid-5th century, during the height of the Classical period, the Greek sculptor Polykleitos of Argos wrote down the rules of the new Greek figural ideal in a treatise he called the Canon, and created a bronze statue of a man holding a spear to illustrate his points. Based on the mathematical theorems of Pythagoras, yep, that Pythagoras from the Pythagorean theorem of a squared plus b squared equals c squared, and his idea that the harmonious proportions could be found in all of nature, Polykleitos set out to show the public that a successful statue resulted from the precise application of abstract principles. According to the Roman historian Elian, and probably a legend, Polykleitos worked on two figures at the same time. One he made according to all the advice and the opinions of visitors who came into his workshop. The other he made according to the rules of his canon. When both were unveiled, the crowd admired one and laughed at the other. Then Polykleitos said, But the one you find fault with you made yourselves, while the one you marvel at I made. This marble Roman copy of the bronze Greek original preserves Polykleitos' ideas since both his essay and sculpture were lost. Based on your reading, write down the ideals of Polykleitos' canon. For nearly a century, Greek sculptors accepted and worked within Polykleitos' ideal proportions. However, the Peloponnesian War and the strife of the 4th century BCE brought an end to the peaceful idealism. In the late classical period, artists again challenged the standards and began to focus more on the individual and on the real-world naturalism. Proportions of the male figure were elongated to create taller figures, and facial expressions became more emotional and poses more exaggerated. Praxiteles' sculpture of Hermes and the infant Dionysus exemplifies this change. Found at the Temple of Hera at Olympia, the sculpture depicts the Greek god Hermes and the baby resting on their journey to Nysa, where little Dionysus was to be raised and tutored by the old satyr Papasolenus and his nymphs. Leaning against a tree, Hermes stands in a sinuous, shallow S-curve. He originally held a bunch of grapes up for Dionysus, who would become the god of wine. This tender and very human interaction between adult and child stands in sharp contrast to the controlled, balanced symmetry of Polyclitus' spear bearer, whose even his hair is perfect. More than just a stylistic change, Praxiteles' sculpture reveals a change in the artistic attitude and intended meaning. Instead of the gods being perfect and unreachable, they have entered the world of human experience and represent beauty that humans too can aspire to, if not ever fully achieve. The death of Alexander the Great in 323 BCE ushered in a new era called the Hellenistic period. While still maintaining the traditional types like the heroic athlete, Hellenistic sculpture focuses more on naturalistic human experience than ever before. Found in Rome and perhaps at one time part of a group, this bronze statue of the seated boxer seems to represent the waning of the once dominant Greek culture. The weary boxer is no longer young and idealistic, but worn out and defeated. Too many punches from powerful hands wrapped in leather thongs have distorted the boxer's face, broken his nose and teeth, and left him with cauliflower ears. The sculptor was so devoted to naturalism that he even inlaid copper to depict blood dripping from the forehead, nose, and cheeks. The Hellenistic sculptor appeals not to the intellectual ideals about perfection or laws of proportion, but to our emotions evoking compassion for the once mighty fighter. 
So, from the ancient Egyptians to the first century Greeks, we've seen how traditions in representing the male figure were established, how stylistic influence spread across geography and time, and how style changed as cultures and generations created innovative ways to represent their own times. Tradition and change are key aspects of how history progresses and make up the millennial old conversation between artists across time. It is our privilege throughout this class to listen in on what they had to say. Make sure you write down these essential knowledge points to wrap up today.